Can you explain why science is vital? Yes, yeah, it's, it's very simple. Half our economy is built on it, pretty much. So it's only so, a money thing. You see, I think that that, well, in a way, well, diminishes I why carry it's on. vital. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, it's, it's obvious to me. I mean, the reason we're not living in caves is because of science. But it's very important to say that. It's a, this, this way of looking at the world, this, this, this idea, the scientific method, the fact that you do experiments, you come up with a theory, you test it. If it doesn't agree with nature, then it's wrong and you throw it away. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. It doesn't matter how important you are. It doesn't matter what your title is. If it disagrees with the experiment, it's wrong. That that has built the modern world self-evidently. So to me, it's almost, I, I can't, it almost doesn't need saying, but of course it does, because science is seen, uh, and this is, goes back to broadcasting again, sometimes there's another genre. It's not just another genre. It's the thing that's, it's the reason we live beyond the age of 20. It's the region inf infant mortality is not really an issue in Britain anymore. Why? Because of science. It's the reason that we have everything. It's the reason that we have a broadcasting industry. It's so obvious, but actually, so that means that its position in popular culture has to be, it has to be in a prime seat in popular culture. It cannot be ghettoized. It should not be on some channel where people who are boffins can subscribe and watch science fiction and science, as Eric was kind of referring to. It has to be center stage. So the question is, how do we, how do, we do that? Well, we've done it to some extent, but the, the challenge, again, to be provocative, is the BBC's done it. Right. So is it possible for the broadcasters to do it? Do they want to? Could they do it if they wanted to? And would it make commercial sense? Well, we'll hopefully hear from some of the broadcasters in a moment. But uh, before we go to the audience, and we will be coming to you in about five minutes, please think of some questions for us. Um, what did you make of the recent Steve Jones report on the, on the BBC's science output? <clears throat> I mean, I essentially agreed with it. I mean, the bit that really crossed over with things I've been saying. I think in the, in the RTS lecture, the Hugh Weldon lecture last year, I made this very clear point, which is that the scientific consensus, the peer-reviewed scientific consensus, should be the basis of news reporting, of television reporting. So it, it's a very interesting thing for a, for a news journalist, I think, if you look at the concepts of balance, that what does balance mean in the context of, let's say, climate change. Let's pick a very controversial area. What does balance mean? Well, the balance in terms of here's some data, here's a model, here's the prediction about what will happen, and here are the errors on that prediction. That's got all the balance built into it that, that you could possibly see is the peer-reviewed consensus. There's, there's no agreement on the details in particular, but the general trend is, is, is agreed on. So you have to report that. To, to, to then have a, a critic give an equal weight on something like Newsnight or Channel 4 News to, to, to argue against it gives a false impression to the audience because actually the, the peer-reviewed consensus is just that. It's the peer-reviewed consensus. Very importantly, though, you've got to separate that from the politics of what you do about it. So it's a legitimate political position to say, I don't think we should do anything about that. I'm happy for the world to warm and the market will deal with it. Or it will be nice, actually, because we can grow vines in the south of England and have a wine industry. You know, these, these might be a ludicrous thing to say, but that's political. So I, I thought that particular part of the report was very important. That it, it's, it's, it almost sounds arrogant, but it isn't if you understand what science is, because it's, it's apolitical, it's a religious, it's a moral in many senses. It's a process, the best process we have for getting to the best answer that we have. Uh, it might not be right, but it's the best process. So it's got to be reported as such, it, otherwise you mislead. The rumoured cuts to BBC Four, again, another sort of negative impact one imagines on science output. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's very worrying, I think, that from my perspective. I mean, my, the first programme I made was on BBC Four. Um, you look at, Jim Al-Khalili's award-winning programs, like the Atom, and you look at Adam Rutherford's Cell, you look at Marcus de Sautoy's programs, have now transferred to BBC Two, but they started on BBC Four. So, and as I say, I, there's two things to say. One is, clearly the BBC is forced to make cuts, and that's a different question. That's about the level of the license fee. So it's almost like, well, what do you expect, first of all? If you cut an organization's revenue stream, then things are gonna get lost. So I, I can see why the debate is being had. But as I say, I would fundamentally disagree with the logic of making a particular channel 
labeling it as a, in a particular way. Like, because I don't think, just philosophically, there's any distinction between science and arts and history and culture. I think what you're talking about is documentary. So documentary, what, would, what box would a history of the discovery of the structure of the atom go in? Is Are you against specialist programming across the board? Or, or just the idea that science should only find its place? I mean, are you talking about a sort of balanced diet in a way? Yeah, I think a, a, a program, a documentary is a documentary. And I don't know, I don't like the idea of, I think the strength of public service broadcasting, this basic Reithian ideal actually, of having a channel that, that Radio 4 is a great example actually. Listen to Radio 4. Uh, and you'd taken from Gardner's question time to something about science to something to PM. And it, 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 I think that idea of, of being able to have a place where people can be exposed to new ideas, because they don't, we go back to that idea that you don't, genuine choice is not being, having your choice so restricted that you just do what you want. Genuine choice is saying, here's a, here's a menu of things. You need to be exposed to it. So I don't agree with the idea of having niche channels. I think it's negative. I think you've made that point very clear indeed. <laughs> I'm going to just read a couple of the tweets and I think we should turn over to the audience now and mm. see what they have to say. Um, some of the tw your tweets, refreshing to hear, this is from Neil Mortensen, refreshing to hear Brian Cox talking about TV's positive influence on young people and on interest in science. Andy Livingston, I think Professor Brian Cox is absolutely right that absolute choice can lead us down very unfortunate silos. Brian Cox makes a good case for PSBs, this is from Mike Dix, to change culture. Maybe it's time for the BBC to do the BBC, this is where we see if I can move the page, the BBC micro... No, it's gone all together. Lucy Micro. Micro. Well, it, did it I mean, end Eric, Micro? I don't think it did. Maybe it's a reference to what Eric Schmidt said last night, which I thought was very important, because the thing is, a, a, a public service like that can, can act in concerts with government in that respect. I, I don't see any... Th that was a good example of the BBC Micro. It was wonderful. It was the, here's the thing. It's going to go into all schools. It's going to teach kids about computer programming. That's brilliant. Shouldn't we be able to do that? Why should we clip the wings of a, of a broadcaster? Why, why is it not possible for the BBC to act in that way? Maybe it is, but it, it doesn't now. So, so it's an interesting question, actually. I why don't know isn't why it, it possible for a broadcaster to act in that way, or why is it possible? Uh, let's open it to you. Can we have some questions from the floor? It's, are you going to turn up the lights a little bit, or am I just going to peer? No. Thank you. That's better. Thanks. Hi. Um, uh, do you have any practical tips for lovies? to learn about <laughs> science. I mean, it, it kind of feels frustrating because you've already gone to university, and, but, you know, it'd be great. To... I, I think it's interesting. I, I did... Um, I, 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 I don't want to start that sentence. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is not a marketing plug. I've just finished a book on quantum mechanics. This is not a marketing plug, right? But I was asked What's by it called? a journalist... <laughs> the quantum universe, right? But, but um, I was asked by a journalist, you know, what, it's, it's, attempt, it's an attempt to really explain the theory. And they said, well, could you see this being taught in schools? Um, and I said, well, yeah, actually. And the reason is that what, what does... It's the same as programming, actually, as Eric Schmidt said last night. What, what do these things do? Quantum mechanics is philosophically difficult, but technically simple, actually. So the, great, the thing you learn by engaging in science, and this is our theory of everything other than gravity, it's absolutely mainstream physics, it tells you that your preconceptions about the world are not necessarily right. In other words, your opinion, your deeply held belief that if I pick that glass up and throw it, it will follow this perfect arc through the air, that's wrong, actually. I mean, quantum, just to do some science, quantum mechanics says that every atom in that glass, at every instant, is exploring the universe. Right? It's literally hopping to every point in the universe, and they're all doing it simultaneously. And, the, and an emergent property is the thing we call a glass, and it sits there roughly where you put it. But the underlying physics is rather confusing. But what's interesting, though, it, that's not technically difficult. It's a great way of training your yourself to just think a little bit differently because nature forces you to do so. So maybe that's the value of science ed education, actually. It's not to know facts. It's to, it's to engage in this nice mental exercise about how should we think about the world, and that spans across all your thinking. So that would be my advice. It's kind of engage because, not because you want to know how big an atom is or what a proton is or something, but just the process 
of, of, of unpicking the way the world works is actually fascinating. But you're, you're quite bullish about this, and I know you, you sort of believe that to say, oh, I just don't know anything about science should be as, as unacceptable as saying, oh, I don't really bother wearing a seatbelt. Well, that's actually illegal, <laughs> but that was your <laughs> In my world, your it'd example. be illegal, yeah. Um, no, it's, it's right. I mean, I, I saw a politician, I won't name them, um, on Newsnight a few years ago, and they actually said that, and it was someone with responsibility for for sort of education and things like that. And they actually said, you know, well, of course, I don't really know anything about science. You, you would never see anyone in that position say, well, of course, I've never read Shakespeare. Of course, I've never listened to Mozart. Of course, I, I don't know the Beatles, even, you know, whatever. You, Ed you don't Miliband say hasn't it. taken any books on holiday with him. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe they do now. Maybe. But, 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 you know, in general, it's the, our culture has, has, has fragmented it's gone into silos as we've said before and, and it's it's acceptable to disregard uh, or have no knowledge of the thing that gave us modern civilization is it better somewhere else i mean yes we we accept it we're guilty we're bad at it uh, and we are well are we though the one thing we have to be careful of in britain is is um we are the second most successful scientific nation in the world by any measure um, second only to America, in, in, by any measure. Our universities are second only to the United States. Our, our efficiency is higher than anybody else. We invest less and get far more. Um, the, the universities, we have the top five universities in Britain, are five of the best universities in the world. So, so it's, it's important not to... But what we, Eric Schmidt negative. said last night is that we're brilliant at inventing and conceiving things, but we aren't very good at sustaining them and building you know, Google. Except, except that 40 odd percent of our economy is based on it. So, you know, we're not bad actually with the six biggest economy in the world. So it's important. That's the point. The point is we're a very strong foundation. And actually you can carry this over to, to the media as well, as Eric said very powerfully. We are the best, right? We, we, it's clear. And, and I, one of the things that surprises me actually about the, the debate about the BBC, sorry, I was just asking one question, but one of, one of the things I, I wanted to say actually is that here is an institution that is clearly a big global brand, a powerful global brand, recognized as the best in the world in many areas. And to even, what the British disease is to even consider damage in that institution. I mean, I think in the parallels with the university sector are interesting. So like Oxford and Cambridge, can we conceive of, of saying we should dismantle those institutions? You know, maybe you wouldn't create them now. Maybe it's odd, maybe it's a little bit elitist, maybe it's strange, but you can't conceive of taking a world-leading brand and dismantling it, whereas we do conceive of that with, with the BBC.